Well, welcome again to another Friday night. We are continuing our series on reparenting, which is how we're framing the path of healing from trauma, is that we have to reparent ourselves, parent ourselves in healthy ways so that our needs are met, so that our wounds can heal. And today I want to come to the topic of thinking. So a parent, to be a good parent, is going to teach the child how to think. Now there's two parts to that that are so important. So when a child is young, a parent teaches a child what to think. They say, this is the truth, this is not the truth. But to be a good parent, they gradually have to teach a child how to think. So that a child can figure out how to think through things so they end up at the truth. So that the parent doesn't have to keep telling them what to do. Now, complex trauma messes that second part up, and it messes up the first part as well. And so what I want you to understand, though, is what we think and how we think has a profound effect on how healthy we are. So much of what we do, what our emotions are, our attitudes comes out of our thinking, our beliefs. And in order to have good thinking and good beliefs, we have to know how to think well. So it's so important. It's a big part of recovery. So we've done a whole series on identifying lies that we believe coming out of complex trauma so that we can replace them with the truth. We've looked at different faulty thinking styles that come out of complex trauma so that we can identify when we jump to worst case scenario, when we go to black and white thinking. We've talked about distortions that happen when we're in our limbic brain and how those distortions feel like the truth and how that can really mess us up. So we talk about thinking all the time. And it's because it is so important to recovery. Now, I just want to say this. This is such a big topic. And like I said, we've done series on aspects of thinking before. So I'm not going to be able to cover all of it today. I'm not going to try to repeat a bunch of stuff that I've already covered. I want to take it in a little new, different direction. But if you want to look at some of those other series... I encourage you to do so because this is so important. And the other thing I want you to understand is every Friday night as I teach, I'm teaching you stuff so you can think. I'm helping you in your thinking. That's my goal. So thinking and growing in this area of thinking is an ongoing process. It's not something you're going to get all figured out right away and all of a sudden have perfect thinking. This is the rest of your life. You're working to understand more and more. You're growing in understanding truth and and healthier thinking. So this, see it in that big perspective. But understand, and this is to me one of the tragedies of complex trauma. It messes up healthy thinking in so many different ways. And that's why we have to keep coming back to it over and over again. Now, having said all of that, I have to add this. Some people hearing me say this are going, oh, good. Thinking, yes, thinking is so important. What you think, how you think, yes, preach it. And what they don't realize is what they're hoping for is that I'm going to present a recovery journey that only involves thinking. That's just academic. That's Get a bit more information and then you'll be fixed. Here's the balancing truth. Healing from trauma involves getting healthy in my thinking and getting healthy in my emotions. And the harder part for most is getting healthy in their emotions. Some people want to just stay focused on thinking as a way to avoid dealing with all that emotional stuff. And so don't misunderstand me when I focus on thinking today to think that I'm saying that that's all that matters in recovery. 
No, we've done a whole series on emotions. Because that is also very, very important. So I want to begin with having you think about types of thinking. And it's really done in understanding how a child's ability to think develops. So we start with the first type of thinking that a child has, which is perceptual or concrete. So a child learns by sticking everything in their mouth, by touching stuff. It's very hands-on. It's sensation-based. And so they don't think of love. They don't think of beauty. They don't think of concepts. They, their thinking is all based on concrete sensory stuff. Now take that further. As the child then, they develop words. Truck car. That's how their language develops. That's how their thinking develops. That is very literal. And so a child's initial concrete thinking is very literal thinking. So if you said to a child, it's raining cats and dogs, they would look out the window expecting to see cats and dogs falling from the sky. Because concrete thinking is literal thinking. Okay. The second part is that a child's thinking is what we call egocentric. Now, ego is often used in a negative way. I'm not using it that way here. What egocentric thinking means is that a child perceives everything that happens is somehow connected to them. They, they don't see stuff from other people's point of view. They only see it from their point of view. And they assume everybody else sees the world the way they see it, through their point of view. So, in a sense, when a child begins to think, it's all about them. So, if you're sad, then what did I do wrong? It, did, am I responsible? If you're happy, I must be good. So, everything is connected to them. And then, they think that everybody else is processing the world like they are processing the world. So it's all egocentric thinking. Can't see anything from other people's perspective. Okay, then it begins to develop. As they get older, now you move to what we call conceptual thinking or abstract thinking. So concept of beauty. You say that to a one-year-old, they don't know what beauty. That concept means nothing. But you show them a beautiful bird. You show them a kitty. You show them the mountains. And then they begin by all of the concrete things to understand the concept of beauty. So they're able now to think beyond just literal concrete things to concepts. That then helps them begin to understand nuances in language. They can now understand a metaphor. It's raining cats and dogs. Oh, I get what you're saying. It's raining really hard. They get metaphor, illustration, concept, nuances of language, body language. They're picking up more and more as they understand concepts, as they think bigger than just literal, actual things. And so that is an important part of development that goes on for years as the child gets older. Then what is happening in the child as well is what we call reflective thinking. So they're now able to process their own feelings. They're able to process their own thoughts. They're able to work through a problem. They're able to figure out what how to fix something or what to do in a certain situation. They're able to think about their behavior. They're able to think about the fact that they hit somebody and the other person's crying and is very upset. They can now reflect. They can become introspective. They can examine themselves and think about themselves. And that takes them to a new level of processing. They can develop a moral code, a value system, priorities begins to come out of that reflective type of thinking. But that needs 
time alone. That needs relaxed time to be able to think like that. Then what begins to develop in there as well is creative thinking. So a child is now able to think outside the box. It's able to think of, oh, it could be done this way. We could do this. So they come up with new ideas, new ways of doing things. They create art. They create things out of Lego blocks. They are able to imagine. They are able to create what they imagine. So that imagination, exploring with their mind, thinking outside of the box, begins to develop. And that enables them, that helps them in problem solving. That helps them in, th in thinking about what to do in different situations. They can think outside of the normal ways. And that leads to the final one, which is the most complex, important type of thinking called critical thinking. Now, I'm not using critical to mean being negative and critical. No, critical thinking is exact thinking. It is carefully analyzing a situation so that you see it accurately. You see the lies, you see the assumptions. So you're critical in the sense that you're spotting what's not healthy, what's inaccurate, what's distorted, so that you see it accurately and then you can come up with an accurate, wise solution. So that is the sign of maturity. That is the sign of a wise mind is the ability to do really good critical thinking. So as you can imagine, it's very complex. So there's a whole bunch of skills, tools that a person needs in order to be able to be a good critical thinking. So let me just give you some of those. You have to be able to define what the problem is. Then you have to identify any assumptions that you're making about the situation. You have to be able to analyze different ideas. You have to be able to logically think things through. And you have to be able to look at different possible hypotheses, solutions, ways of solving it. And then you got to be able to evaluate the different possible solutions for strengths and weaknesses. you got to weigh out pros and cons. All of those things become part of critical thinking. So there's a lot of complex, important tools that are needed there. But what I want you to see is critical thinking is essential for good problem solving. It is essential for good decision making, for goal setting. Let me read you some quotes on the importance of critical thinking for children, that children learn how to do it. And this is, again, research that's constantly being done around child development and development of thought and thinking process. So it says this, everyday kids are bombarded with messages, information, and images. And in our culture today, that's true more than any other generation. They need to know how to evaluate what they're hearing on TV, on Facebook, other social media. And see, they need to know how to evaluate what they're hearing and seeing in order to form their own opinions and beliefs. Critical thinking skills are the foundation of education as well as an important life skill. Without the ability to think critically, kids will struggle academically, especially as they get older. They're bombarded with so many messages, all claiming to be the truth. How do they figure out what is the truth? How do they figure out what matters in life? When they're seeing all kinds of advertisements, they need to be able to think critically. Research indicates that kids who lack critical thinking skills face a higher risk of behavior problems. 
Somebody said this, not thinking carefully and critically can lead to information being misconstrued and misconstrued information can lead to problems in school, work, and relationships. And then critical thinking skills can help someone better understand themselves, better understand other people and the world around them. They can assist in everyday problem solving, creativity, and productivity. And then critical thinking also fosters independence. So you don't need to always feel like you got to conform to fit in. It enhances creativity. It encourages curiosity. Kids who are taught to use critical thinking skills ask a lot of questions and never just take things at face value. They want to know the why behind things. Don't just tell me, explain it. Why? And then good critical thinking skills also can lead to better relationships, reduced distress, because you can resolve problems better, improve life satisfaction. Someone who can solve everyday problems is likely to feel more confident in their ability to handle whatever challenges life throws their way. So, just to show you that there's so many benefits that come out of being able to think well. And so again, it's not just what you think, it's how you think. That is so important. So complex trauma messes it all up. So first of all, complex trauma is all about distortions. You are given lies, you are given distortions. And so your life about your identity, about love, about others, about relationships, about happiness, about success, about your value is all based on distortions and lies. So what you believe is not healthy. But then it goes beyond that. Ways of handling information. So you grow up with parents who deny, live in denial. You're not sad, you're, you're, you're happy. You're not angry, get over it. And they deny, they deny problems. They don't talk about problems. Or they minimize, you don't have it as bad as somebody else, so don't feel sorry for yourself. Or they rationalize. Then gaslighting. Complex trauma is important to understand is usually all about gaslighting. The authority in your life told you that your needs didn't matter. The authority in your life told you that your perception of things wasn't accurate that you were being selfish when you thought you were being loving. And so complex trauma is a gaslighting process where you begin to doubt your own perceptions of reality. You begin to doubt your ability to think things through because you're told you're stupid or wrong. And then it's twisted all the time that if something's wrong, it's your fault. That's a gaslighting process. So that's distorting at a big time level for people. And then complex trauma is deflecting. So parents, instead of owning their own stuff and facing where they fall short, deflect. Make it somebody else's fault. Find ways to not look at it. And so you can point out something to them and they come up with a deflection and then they never think about it again. And they never deal with the problem. So deflection, deflection is a big thing. And we've done a talk on that. And then for many of you, your parents told you what to think right through to your adult life. They never taught you how to think. They just told you what to think. And you knew that if you were going to get any validation from them or be accepted in love, it was conditional on you thinking what they thought. So you weren't able to explore your own thinking. You just had to figure out what does dad think and agree with him. Then for some of you, what comes out of complex trauma is you don't have an idea of what normal or healthy looks like. So you don't even know how to think and you don't even know how if you've arrived at healthy. So you go, okay, is this healthy or, or is this? Or maybe it's this or maybe it's that. And so your thinking can never get settled because nobody ever showed you or modeled for you what healthy is. And then for some of you, 
Complex trauma always involved not being able to resolve painful emotions or problems. And what that meant for some of you is you became an obsessive thinker. You just thought and thought and thought. You couldn't turn your brain off. It was you were the hamster on the wheel trying to find a solution to your problem. Others of you, you developed what I call the paralysis of overanalysis. You just analyzed everything to death but never acted. Because you could never get to a point where you could figure it out. So it ended up paralyzing you. For some of you, you just shut her down. You just said, I can't resolve anything in my thinking, so I'm not going to think. I'm just going to go through life doing, acting on impulse, not thinking deeply about anything, because there's no point in that. And then what you have to understand about complex trauma is that when you're in survival mode, you don't have that relaxed brain time necessary to develop reflective thought, creative thought, critical thought. You can't weigh out options because when you're in survival mode and it could be life or death, you, you just need one or two options at the most. You don't have time to explore nuances. You just got to do what's necessary now in order to survive. So creativity's out the window. Reflective thinking is out the window. Creative thinking or critical thinking is out the window because you're in survival mode. A lot of people in complex trauma, they develop tunnel vision. So when you're in fear, you're focused on the thing that's causing you fear. And you lose sight of all the other issues, all the other factors. You can't see them because you can only see the one issue. And that prevents you from being able to think it through. Some of you, you were taught to discount the positive. So you got a report card, your parents and say, wow, straight A's except for one B, great. They said, why did you get a B? They focused on the negative. They discounted the positive. And then for some that went further, you focus on one negative thing, then you blow it up and you magnify it. And now it's, it's the only thing. It's a huge thing. It consumes you. And so for some, you have a mental filter. You can hear what somebody is saying to you, and it could be 90% positive, but your mental filter only picks out the negative. That's all you hear in conversations. You don't hear accurately what people are saying. You just have a filter that only picks up the negative things that are being said. Some of you jump to conclusions. Some of you jump to worst-case scenario. Some of you overgeneralize. Always, never, that's how you describe things. For some of you, you label things. So if a person is an indigenous person or a black person or a Latino person or a certain religion, you just put a label on them. Then, And that label always has some negative things that in your mind, so you lump them all in the same basket. But to me, the big ones are emotional reasoning. And what that refers to is when your limbic brain is triggered, you have feelings that feel like the truth. And so you're thinking about what is reality is based on how you're feeling, not based on the facts. So let me give you an example. Somebody sets a boundary with you. They love you dearly, but they set a boundary with you that feels like rejection so emotional reasoning says because I feel like I'm being rejected it must be true that they're rejecting me which isn't true at all but it feels like it or somebody's not happy and you feel guilty and so what emotional reasoning does is because I feel guilty I must be guilty so I must have done something wrong to make them unhappy. So emotional reasoning bases truth not on facts but on my feelings. And that is very dangerous for people from complex trauma. Next thing, complex trauma gives you the wrong math class on life. So let's say you're developing, you're thinking about life 
and you realize that so far in my life, everybody I've let into my heart close to me has hurt me. Everybody, 100%. So what does the child begin to conclude as that happens again and again? Therefore, it is fact that if you let anybody close, they will hurt you. Therefore, don't let anybody close. So you build a theory of life based on your experience, but it ends up being distorted. See, you don't see that everybody that you let close to you was unhealthy, that was unsafe. You did not have in your experience letting a healthy person close. So your theory was based on not a complete set, but a partial set. But to you, you thought it was a complete set. And it ended up faulty. So another one is a child comes into the world and they be authentic. They just are out there. But then they learn that if you're authentic, people make fun of you. People punish you. People don't want to be your friend. You get shamed. You get rejected. So they go, authenticity equals lack of connection, equals shame, equals rejection. Therefore, never be authentic if you want to be loved, if you want to fit in, based on their reality. And so what you're doing in recovery is challenging some of your experience to say, that might have been right in my childhood, but that was an incomplete set of test subjects. So I need to reevaluate it. There's another phenomenon that happens in complex trauma that we call groupthink. And that's basically, let's picture your dad saying, we're a family and we all think this. We all think this type of people are bad. We all think this political group is good. We think together. And the child feels pressure that if I want to fit in, I better conform and think the way the group's thinking Or the child wants to please the father, is enamored with the father. And so they do mental gymnastics to get themselves to believe what the father is saying. So they think like the group. There's a subtle pressure that they don't even realize. That to get accepted, to get loved, you have to think. So group think is something that easily comes out of complex trauma. But then there's a huge one called binary thinking. Now, binary thinking goes by black and white thinking. It goes by all or nothing thinking. It goes by dichotomous thinking. And it goes by dualistic thinking. Let me just give you some examples. Some people come into recovery and they think all or nothing, black or white. There's no gray. So for them is if I don't do recovery perfectly, then I fail. That's my only two options, black or white, perfect or failure. They don't see that recovery is struggle. They don't see that recovery is up and down. They're binary in their thinking. There's zeros or ones. That's it. Or let me give you another example. If I was to say to you, harm reduction, and you're part of the addiction community, addiction recovery, some of you would go to all bad. Oh, that's everybody needs to do harm reduction. You wouldn't be able to wrestle with the gray. But what about, but what about this? Well, we need safeguards here. This could go too far here. You would just go terrible idea or a great idea. You wouldn't be able to wrestle with the gray. So what's important to understand in complex trauma is complex trauma causes people to be attracted to that kind of thinking, binary thinking, because it creates a psychological sense of safety. If I know this is right, this is wrong, then life is really easy. Then I feel safe. Then I feel secure. I don't like gray because gray, I might miss something, something might happen where I get hurt. I like life where it's very rigid, where it's very dogmatic, where it's very clear cut. This is right, this is wrong, there's nothing in between. 
So there is an attraction for people from complex trauma who look for a sense of security in a very rigid black and white world. More than that, when you think of a person in survival mode, a person in danger, they want a black and white answer. They don't want, you know what, here are 10 different options with a whole bunch of nuances you need to think through as to the best way to act in this situation. They go, no, 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 I'm in danger here. I need to know, do I do this or that? Will this let me survive or will that let me survive? Will this kill me or that kill me? Make it simple, make it clear, make it black and white. So complex trauma causes people to have to think in black and white to survive, and that also creates an attraction to continue to think that way in order to feel safe. Now, the problem with it that comes out of complex trauma is that usually when it's black or white, in our mind there's judgment. So it's not just black or white, this way or that, it's right or wrong. This way is, you're better than the people that go this way. And so there's usually an an attachment of judgment to it that causes you to think that the people taking this way are better than people taking that way. So let me give you an example. If you're living in the States or a place where there's basically two political parties, Democrats, Republicans, it's very easy to think that anybody that is healthy Anybody that is wise, anybody that's spiritual is going to see the world the way I see it, is going to come up with the same values and priorities for a political party. Anybody that's in the opposite party, well, they're stupid. They're, and you disparaging comments. You give a judgment, a negative thing. Because in black and white thinking, it's, You can't imagine how anybody who's healthy or spiritual could see the world and come up with different conclusions than you do. And so that causes you to polarize in society. And we have seen a lot of that in our culture. So those are ways that complex trauma messes up thinking. And that's why I want you to understand you just don't get over that overnight. You're not even aware of half of that. Most of that happens at a subconscious level. And it's just gradually that you become self-aware of how you think and, and all of the lies that you believe. So here's what I want you to understand about these. Really two things. When you have distorted thinking, unhealthy thinking, it always results in negative consequences in my life. It leads to negative emotions, it leads to negative behaviors, it leads to negative priorities, it leads to unhealthiness. Unhealthy thinking never results in healthy. Understand that. But take that further. If you have unhealthy thinking, it can increase your anxiety. It can increase your depression. It can increase your stress. It can cause all kinds of mental health issues psychological, even physical issues. So your thinking is not some part of you that is in a compartment that doesn't affect anything else. It affects everything. And if your thinking is not healthy, it will affect all of you negatively. But let me just go to practical healing stuff. So what can we do just to get going in learning to think in healthy ways. So I'm going to begin with this. A child, one of the reasons they need a healthy parent is because they learn to think by being around their parent. Their parent doesn't teach them just what to think, it teaches them how to think. So today in your recovery, if you're going to learn to think healthy, you need a mentor who's a healthy thinker. Now I have to add a little note here. Because I've had a lot of people that wanted me to mentor them. But what I found is they want me still to tell them what to think. They want me to solve their problems for them and say, this is the best way to go. They don't like it when they come to me with a problem and I go, 
Well, what are your options? What do you see? Okay, what about this? What about this? What about this? Well, tell me what to think. No, no, no. I want to show you how to think so that you can make a decision. But they don't want to do that because they're afraid of making the wrong decision. And so they want me to make the decision so that they won't fail. And I go, no, no, I'm not going to be that kind of mentor. That'll keep you from growing. That'll keep you with an unhealthy dependence on me to do your thinking for you. And I'm not going to do that. So make sure your mentor is not going to be somebody that's going to do your thinking for you, but it's going to teach you how to think. There's seven basic steps to improve critical thinking skills. Okay, so when you're facing a problem, pinpoint what is the problem, what's the issue here. Secondly, collect information. Now, some of you, your perfectionism will kick in and you'll burn yourself out trying to collect information. So you might have to limit that. But thirdly, then examine the information. Think it through, scrutinize it, and get information that comes at it from different angles, different perspectives. And then decide from the information what's relevant, what's more relevant than others. So you kind of prioritize the information. Then you evaluate what's going on inside you. Draw conclusions. And then be able to explain why you chose that conclusion. So that's kind of seven basic steps. Now I hope you realize that you don't just sit down usually and do that in an hour. That could be days. So big problems, you've got you to do lots of research and lots of thinking and weighing out different hypotheses and all of that. Now let me give you some, if, you're a brand, if you were a brand new parent, here's how you would help your child develop critical thinking skills. Okay, So these are things you can do today with yourself that are going to encourage critical thinking. So with a child... It's easy to give supervised play where you play with them and you say, we're going to do this next and how about we do this? But what helps develop a child's critical thinking skills is unsupervised play where they go off and they create and they explore and they have to problem solve and they have to come up with different ways of doing stuff. So unstructured play can help you in your critical thinking Next one that's really important is pause and wait. See, what happens for a lot of people is as soon as I feel an uncomfortable emotion, I don't like it. And so we impulsively do something to make ourselves feel better, to get out of that. But that impulsive decision is not a well thought through decision. It's just concerned about instant gratification, instant relief. So... I need to pause and sit in the discomfort for a while and think. And sometimes some great thinking comes out of uncomfortable sitting. So pause and wait. If you had a child who was facing a problem, they're trying to put something away or open a door or build something and they're not able to figure it out, the temptation often is to intervene too quickly to solve it for them. But children learn when you don't intervene too quickly, when you let them get a bit frustrated, when you let them try all kinds of different things, looking for solutions. Now, you don't let them sit there forever, but there's value in not intervening too quickly. And so, when you are facing a problem, don't reach out for help too quickly if it's one that you need to think through. That is an important part of growing up. With a child, you ask open-ended questions. What would you like to do today? What would you like for your birthday? You don't say, for your birthday, we were thinking of going here or here. Which one would you like? No, open-ended. Let them explore different options. So ask yourself open-ended questions. And then, if your child comes to you and says, I don't know what I should do for sports. I like football. I like soccer. I like all these different sports. <clears throat> Don't just say, I think this would be best for you. Say, here's a hypothesis one. Let's think about football, pros, cons. Let's think about 
Hockey, let's think about soccer, pros, cons. Get them to think it through. Get them to weigh it out. Different hypotheses. And then encourage them to think outside the box. Encourage them to think in new ways, in different ways. So have you ever thought of this? Have you ever looked at it from this perspective? That can help them so much. And so what I, again, just want to emphasize is thinking is such an important part of a healthy life. Healthy thinking, healthy beliefs and values. Complex trauma just messes all of that up. So reparenting is relearning not just what to think, but how to think. And learning to be a good, critical thinker. So I develop a wise mind. Okay, that's the end of part one. Hopefully that was helpful. We're going to take a short break, then we're going to come back for part two, which is a Christian part. If that doesn't interest you, not a problem. We're not offended. If you want to leave, we'll see you next week. For everybody else, we'll be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. We've been working our way through the story of Queen Esther, queen, a Jewish woman who became queen of the Medo-Persian Empire. And last week, we saw that Esther had invited her husband, King Xerxes, and his right-hand man, Haman, to a banquet. And the king knows she's got a really big request she wants to make. He doesn't know that it's in response to Haman's law to get all the Jews killed. And Esther wants to save her people. So they came to the first banquet. King said, what do you want? Esther said, come to a second banquet. So we finished the first banquet. Here's what happens next. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai, so he's in happy and he's in high spirits because... Wow, I must be important. The queen just invited me to a banquet, and there's only other, one other person on the banquet, and that's the king. So, wow, that means I'm super important if I get included as the only other guest with the king. So he's all high spirits, full of himself, feeling great. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that the, he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. So I just ruined his day seeing Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. But this has got him triggered big time. He is in limbic brain crazy. So he calls together his friends and Zeresh, his wife. Haman boasts to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him. And how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman had. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she's invited me along to another banquet tomorrow with the king. So he's just bragging, bragging. But, but then he says this, but all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and his friends said to him, Okay, let's set up a pole reaching to 100 feet tall. Ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. So let's kill Mordecai. If he's your only problem and he's ruining your day after all of these wonderful things are happening, let's get rid of him. You're powerful enough now, just ask the king. So this suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. So, here's what I want you to see. Haman is planning to go first thing in the morning to ask the king for permission to kill Mordecai. That's his plan. Nobody knows about it. Esther doesn't know about it. Mordecai doesn't know about it. The king doesn't know about it. So now, 
Esther can't intervene. Mordecai can't intervene. How are we going to stop this plan that's going to get Mordecai killed? So now in this extreme situation, now we see God work. But what I want you to understand is the way God works. God could have just taken, wiped out Haman, somehow made him sick, give him a heart attack, stopped him, something like that. But the way God works is you don't even see God. It's the weirdest thing. So this is why we call it God's providence. It's that humans are making decisions. Humans are going through life. But somehow God makes what he wants happen. So let me just quickly take you through this. So God is going to save Mordecai's life. But through that, he's going to expose Haman, and he's going to make the king sympathetic to the Jewish people. So, here's number one. That night, the king could not sleep. So the king has insomnia. He's frustrated. He can't sleep. So, he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the records of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. So that has one of two options. He's either saying can't sleep, I might as well get up and work. So let's go through some of the history. Or, what's the most boring thing that I could have read, with, read to me so that maybe I can fall asleep? Well, let's get a book of history. That'll knock me out. Anyways, King Can't Sleep decides to get book of the history of his reign read. So that was coincidence one. Now we come to coincidence two. The servant just so happens to pick this section. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed to Bithana, had exposed Bithana and Tirish, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, that they were conspiring to assassinate King Xerxes. Remember that it had been written down, but the king had never done anything about it when it happened? So now the king can't sleep, says, somebody read to me my boring history stuff. And it just so happens that they read about the event where Mordecai exposed the assassination plot from these two men. And so the king says, what honor was given and recognition was given to Mordecai for doing this? All of a sudden he's awake, it's grabbed his attention. And they say, nothing's ever been done to him. Okay, so this is happening in the middle of the night. We don't see any evidence of God. We just see a king with insomnia just happens to read this certain event and realizes nothing was done to honor Mordecai, who saved my life. So, at that moment in time, the king hears somebody coming in early, out in the court. He doesn't know it's Haman. He just hears somebody and he says, who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole that he had set up for him. His attendant answered, Haman's out there, bring him in. Now before giving Haman a chance to talk, the king says, I got a question for you, Haman. What do you think should be done for the man the king delights to honor? So Haman, if I was really wanting to honor somebody, what do you think I should do? So Haman is coming in to get Mordecai killed. He doesn't know that the king is wanting to honor Mordecai. He thinks that when the king is asking about honoring somebody, that the king is saying, Haman, you're such a good guy, I want to honor you. What could I do to honor you? So, because the king started the conversation and didn't specify who was being honored, Haman makes a bunch of assumptions. So here's what is said, and this is where it gets comical. Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he said, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe that the king has worn, And a horse that the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to the one 
to one of the king's most noble princes, let them robe the man the king delights to honor, so dress him up, lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, announcing, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. So have a parade, dress him up with the king's clothes, with the king's horse, put a big parade, do it upright. King says, great idea. And you imagine Haman going, oh boy, I'm just going to have a great day. And the king says, go at once. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. All the air just went out of Haman's sails. Talk about a fantasy turning to a horror story. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He rode Mordecai, led him on horseback throughout the city, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Can you imagine the shame, the embarrassment? Haman's gritting through his teeth. He hates this man. He wants to see this man dead. He was planning to have him killed. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh his wife and all his friends everything that had happened. His wife and advisors said to him, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. Wow. In one night at crunch time, at the 11th hour, a whole bunch of weird coincidences happen that cause Haman to not be able to have Mordecai killed, that cause Mordecai to be honored, to cause the king to think highly of the Jews and Mordecai. And all of that sets up getting ready to go into the banquet where Esther is going to ask the king to save the Jewish people. And when the king says, who wants to kill the Jews? She's going to say, Haman does. And it's going to change everything. Here's what I want you to understand. We have to do our part. And even when it doesn't seem God is working at times, God is somehow in ways we cannot understand taking all of the different decisions made by thousands of people and somehow things happen. It's a mystery. It's amazing. It's the best we can do to understand it. But what I want you to see is that somehow God is involved in life. And what sometimes seems like something insignificant, like insomnia, can be something that God uses. It becomes a significant part of God's plan. But what I also want you to see is that sometimes God doesn't step in until the last minute. We don't like that because that creates too much anxiety. But I also want you to see that when it came to saving the Jewish people, God was going to use Esther. But do you realize that God also was using Xerxes who didn't even care for God? So God can use very surprising people, people we wouldn't have chosen to help accomplish what he wants to accomplish. So God's plan is not carried out just by those who love God. It's also carried out by those who don't love God. God can use both. So God, again, in amazing ways, worked in unseen ways to get everything set up to save the Jewish people. And so I don't know where you're at in your life right now. You might be at a dark time where you just don't think God's involved. You've done everything you can and you just don't see your way th through it. This beautiful story of Esther shows that somehow God can still be working and involved. We just can't see it until after the fact. I hope that encourages you. Let's pray. 
Father, I just love this story. I just love learning and thinking about your providence, that your normal way in working in our lives is not miracles, is not in obvious ways. It's in unseen ways. It's life goes on. Decisions are made by thousands of people. We try to do what we think is right. And sometimes we're not even sure you're there, but then later we look back and see that you were very much involved. And just help us to trust. Help us to learn from this that you can be trusted even in the dark times. Amen. Well, thank you again for being with us. Just hope you've been blessed. Hope you have a great week.